Good morning. Thanks, Bruno. Thanks, everyone, for coming. It's always a pleasure to be here at uh, UX Lisbon. I'm going to talk today about a, a topic uh, called Jobs to be Done. Um, there's my Twitter handle if you want to follow me on Twitter, at Jim Callback. I am the head of cu customer success at Mural. Mural is an online whiteboard, um, very interesting and relevant for designers. If you haven't uh, checked out Mural, please do so. It's mural.co for a free trial. In 2007, I wrote my first book called Designing Web Navigation. And since then, I've been looking at more strategic concerns around UX design that culminated in my book, Mapping Experiences, which came out in 2016, May, May of last year. Um, that's available for sale upstairs. If you buy a copy, I'd be happy to sign it for you. Um, and it's a topic in that book that I wanted to expand on. I, I, I mentioned jobs to be done briefly in the book, but I wanted to talk a lot more about it today with you here. Um, I want to make three points throughout my, my talk, so I'm going to make three big points. But um, allow me to digress a little bit before I get started. Um, and I want to ask the question, what is disruption? The word disruption, we can see it in many different ways. Um, we can think about disruption as changing the norm or an, an upheaval of the norm or chaos even. But there's also a very specific definition of the word disruption, particularly from a business standpoint. And I wanted to start by talking about what is disruption from a business standpoint. And we can use this chart to explain it. A company, an offering, progresses over time. <clears throat> and the performance of that offering increases. Um, these two lines in the middle uh, represent the low end, low end market demand and the high end market demand. So when a company starts out, they have an idea that's maybe not ripe. Um, it's a startup. And they develop that solution, that offering until it meets the low end of the market demand. But it increases in power, right? You want to be able to charge more money for, for it. You want to add new features and services. Um, this is, oh wait, sorry. I think mine does work, though. <laughs> um, and it, it gets better and better incrementally. You get 10% better with the feature, and you add, add more and more to it, and that justifies a higher price. And you eventually reach the high end of market demand. And this is normal growth. This is, not bad. this is not a bad thing. This is what all companies strive to do. They want to grow in, in lots of different ways. And you grow incrementally. And that's called a sustaining innovation. <clears throat> but what happens is this leaves the, the incumbent, the existing offering, open to low end disruption. And what happens is another offering comes in and meets low end market demand. It gets the jobs done for the customers at the low end. And it comes in, and it's cheaper, and it's, it performs le well, less, actually, lower. It has lower performance. Um, but that's not static either. And that product gets better and better and better until it starts eroding the market of the uh, uh, incumbent, the, the offering that had been there for a while. And disruption is really about a competitive response. Because what happens when, when this new product is launched, these guys say, yeah, but we're a premium product. We have high-end customers. We charge a lot. We're a lot more powerful. That they're just starting out. And that attitude assumes that they're going to stay static. But of course, that company wants to grow until they eat the lunch of the, of the incumbent. And this is, um, a, in a nutshell, this is, these are the dynamics of disruption. So when we say disruption in disruptive technology, in a business standpoint, it has a very specific definition and a very specific meaning, the disruptor. Um, here are some examples of disruption. Right? Encyclopedias disrupted by Wikipedia. Bookstores disrupted by online uh, sh stores like Amazon. CDs, MP3s. Film photography disrupted by digital photography. Premium airlines, budget airlines. Rental cars from car sharing. And telephones by conference uh, uh, systems, uh, voice over IP. Right? And it's this last one I want to talk uh, a little bit more about um, and give an example. I used to work for a company called um, GoToMeeting. How many people know GoToMeeting? GoToMeeting, OK. A lot of you, but not, not all of you, GoToMeeting. In 2011, so uh, around 2000, the company got started um, <clears throat> on this trajectory of you know, in, in improving performance so they can justify their higher and, uh, price and move upstream, up market. And in 2011, this is an article from Gig GigaOM. In 2011, GoToMeeting launches high-definition video conferencing. It was called HD Faces. N not only do you have audio and video, but you have high-definition webcams. 
right? This, they're, they're a little 10% little more so they can justify their $50 a month, um, uh, $50 a month price. Um, without kind of regard, this is them looking at their own technology and improving their own technology, almost for technology's sake. Looking, does anybody want that? Does anybody need that? And I want to share a little video that I saw from uh, um, the, the new season of Silicon Valley. Does anybody watch Silicon Valley on HBO? Yeah. You guys like that? Okay. Go to HBO.com and watch Silicon Valley. If you're in software development, it's absolutely hilarious. So if you know the scene <coughs> or the uh, setup, there's a company called Pied Piper, and they do data compression, but they have this video chat application. And in this scene, the CEO is showing the other developers his new compression that gets 10% better video quality. Um, uh, and just uh, take a look at the reaction of everybody else here. So I'm just going to start this video. I hope the sound is good. Let's see. I, uh... I started to optimize our code to handle higher traffic. Then it occurred to me, why rewrite our old code when I can build a new encoder that doesn't strip away a ton of channels and metadata? So I extended my compression algorithm to support, get this, 12-bit color. OK, so our users will be able to experience a 10% increase in image quality with absolutely no increase in server load whatsoever. Just, 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 just watch this. Before, after. Before, after. Richard, I'm trying very hard not to completely lose my shit right now. I get it, I get it. After every VC in town turned this down, we decided that the best way to stay alive until we got to a million users was to cut server usage. Remember that? The whole reason that Guildford and I stayed up for 48 fucking straight hours was to decrease server load, not keep it the same. Technically, the reason why we stayed up for two days was to maximize our ability to get a million users. And I just did that because who doesn't want 10% better image quality? Who doesn't want it? Everyone. Everyone doesn't want it. We already have the best video chat. People are using this on their cell phones. They're not going to be able to tell a fucking difference. Guys, this is a better product. And I'm the CEO, and I'm going to say this is where we go. I'm the CEO. This is where we're going to go. It's a better product. It was a better product. It's 10% 10, 10 better, right? Thinking about an incremental innovation. But the question, who actually needs this and who wants it? Or the fact that they're using their cell phones, their mobile phones, when they're doing this, right? It becomes irrelevant. This is uh, just symptomatic. Now, they're a startup, so it, it's not actually a disruptive, uh, disruption uh, dynamic going on here in, in, in particular. But the, the attitude of making a better product and launching that in the hopes of getting more, you know, more customers, he wanted to get up to a million users with better um, high-definition video. And for me, watching this, it was very comical because that was pretty much the language going on at, at GoToMeeting at the time. We're going to get more visitors because we have HD HD uh, webcams. The same time that GoToMeeting was growing up, this, this, was, um, this started, right? Anybody who knows Skype? Raise your hand if you've ever heard of Skype. Yeah, that's like everybody, right? What was the competitive response from GoToMeeting to Skype when it came out, right? We're a premium product. We have business customers. We're for, we're for serious business people, right? Skype is for college kids to call home and chat with their girlfriends, right? That's OK. They can live down there in the low end of the market. They're free. We, we, we charge $50 a month. We're way up here. But that assumes that Skype is going to stay static. What happened to Skype? They improved their services and their quality. And they eventually had, in my opinion, better audio than GoToMeeting and most other services. And then what happened around the same time that article that I just showed in 2011, what happened to Skype? Where did they end up? And what did Microsoft brand them? Skype for business. Right, so now, now go to meeting and Skype are literally head to head. Um, so disruption is when the competitive response from the high end is, oh, don't take them seriously. That's just the low end. Um, at the heart of this dynamic, though, is this notion of looking at the goals that customer have and what they're trying to get done, and we can call that the job to be done. 
Um, and that's what Clayton Christensen outlines in his book, The Innovator's Dilemma. It's probably the most famous and most widely read business book out there. If you, if you don't have The Innovator's Dilemma, I do recommend you read it. It is a business book, but um, it's, it's fascinating reading. Um, in his um, follow-up book, The Innovator's Solution, particularly in chapter four in there, he expounds on this notion of jobs to be done. And basically what he's saying is that companies get disrupted because they stop focusing on the job that the customer is trying to get done. <clears throat> and a job to be done is not a task. Sometimes the term jobs to be done gets confused with task analysis. It's not. It's actually about a progress towards a goal. It's, about, it's, it's ultimately about a need. Jobs to be done perspective sees consumers as um, goal-seeking agents, that we're trying to improve our lives, we're trying to solve a problem. And that, that act of trying to solve a problem is a job, and we call it a job to be done. It's not about demographics, it's not about solutions either. So one of the, one of the uh, kind of principles of jobs to be done thinking is you need to describe the job to be done without describing a technology or a solution. You need to look at what human being, what the person is trying to get done, and this sh shows causality, why people buy products, why they hire our solutions over other solutions, is because of the job to be done. So the first point that I want to make is that at the core of disruption, this very, very important business theory, um, is the re realization that opportunity, business opportunity, comes from understanding the jobs that people want to get done. So I think for us, you know, the, you know, the advocacy for, for understanding our customers and under, understanding human behavior is kind of, feels kind of natural, but th this, should be, this should be fucking interesting for all of us in this room because this is what business people are talking about more and more these days, right? So never before in my, in my experience or my opinion has what business people are talking about in terms of the, the dynamics of business opportunity overlapped with what we're talking about. And I think part of my message here today is that I think we should be part of this conversation and be involved in what they're talking about when they say jobs to be done. So understanding jobs to be done. Part of the problem um, with the, the theory of jobs to be done is there's not really a codified language or a way to look at um, jobs to be done. There's a couple of competing perspectives and competing approaches out there. Um, but um, I, I, I offer this practical model for under, uh, understanding jobs to be done. Again, if a job to be done is a progress towards a goal, um, we, can, we can describe it uh, one way uh, along uh, several different dimensions. The functional job, and I, I made that bigger because typically a job to be done is described by its functional job. That's why it gets confused with task analysis. But we can also talk about the emotional job and the social job that's involved there. And I'll give an example of this coming up. But it's also a contextual. It's also a job to be done is for a certain context. Notice we're not talking about the psychodemographics of a customer, a persona. That doesn't, that doesn't drive behavior, but their context um, and the job that they need to get done does. Let me just give you an example of those six dimensions or six facets of a job to be done. Let's say you want to hire a keyless lock. They have these locks for your front door that are wireless hooked up to the internet. You can actually open your door with your smartphone. You can see online who's entered your house or not. You can let people in or not. The functional job is you want to control access to your home, and that's how you might describe the job to be done. But there's also an, an emotional job there too, right, in, in this goal that I have. I want to feel safe and secure, right? So if this solution came out and it, it, it met that functional job but didn't meet that emotional job, it, uh, people might not hire that solution. There's also a social job. It lets visitors in, but keeps strangers out. <clears throat> but then we also need to look at the circumstances around this keyless uh, lock. Uh, you know, pr is, this is for private homeowners to let people in during the day when they're not at work. When they're at work, um, and the motivation is to solve the problem of selective access. And then there are these things called desired outcomes. So we have the job to be done, which we can describe by functional, emotional, and social. But the desired outcomes are the metrics, the, the means by which we subjectively judge whether that solution is meeting our job or not. Right? So, we, so you have a job to be done and you have a desired outcome. And you can express desired outcomes um, in, in a series of statements. So for any one job to be done, there might be a dozen or several dozen desired outcome statements. And it's that last point that I wanted to just expound, expand on because I want to show how you can actually find business opportunities by understanding the job to be done in particular, the desired outcome portion of a job to be done. Um, and there's a method that had been pioneered by a guy named Tony Ulwick 
that normalizes the statements for the desired outcomes. And the way that you get these uh, statements, by the way, is going out and talking to people, where they, where they are, where they work, or where they're, where they're, where they're playing, um, if that's what, what you're looking at. You go out and collect all of these desired outcome statements, and you put them into a normalized format. And the normalized format begins with a verb that shows direction. Either you're going to move something down or, or raise it. So you're either going to minimize, reduce, decrease, or lower something, or you're going to maximize, increase, or raise something. The next, um, the next element is a unit, usually a noun, that shows the, the thing that you want to move up or down. In this case, it's maximize my ability, and then you have a qualifier to allow visitors in during the day. So you do observations of the world, look at the job to be done, and collect these desired outcome statements in a qualitative way. But then you can actually measure opportunity, business opportunity, with a quantitative survey. You can ask a sample of the, the job executors, the people in your market that are of, of interest to you. You can, you can ask them two questions for each desired outcome statement. You can ask them how important is that to you, and how satisfied are you currently with getting that solution done scale of 1 to 10 on each. So what this gives you is a scale of where that desired outcome fits in a matrix, like this. And where business opportunity happens is right here. Things that are important to people but aren't satisfied. Right? And that's, by the way, this is where disruption also potentially happens. If you have an existing offering, <clears throat> Um, you need to watch out for these things, because if somebody figures out a cheaper way or a better way to do that, um, <clears throat> to, to fulfill those jobs for customers, you may be disrupted. And this is the method uh, pioneered by Tony Ulwick. It's, it's quite scientific and very specific in, in its methodology. But it's using the jobs to be done theory, general jobs to be done theory, which I think overlaps with a lot of our thinking, but comes from the business literature. Um, and he has operationalized the jobs to be done theory to pinpoint where business opportunity is, but from customer needs. In fact, look at the title of the article where he explains this method. Turn customer input into innovation, right? So these are, these are business folks talking about um, similar topics that, that we have, uh, but from a business standpoint. So my second point is that jobs to be done give designers, they give us a way of capturing insight that leverages our skills to help inform um, business to find, help find business opportunities. I think that's, I think that's important and that's pretty cool too. Um, there, there's still not one central um, place or language around this, this notion of jobs to be done. And people like Tony Ulwick and Clayton Christensen, they tend to consult CEOs of you know, Fortune 500 companies. They, they operate way up in the stratosphere and they're talking about a corporate strategy and corporate innovation, like what markets should you be in and that, that, those types of things. But I think jobs to be done can actually be applied at a much, much more practical level and can pervade the organization. So I'm seeing this jobs to be done thinking, again, similar to, to, to concepts that we already know around user-centered design or human-centered design. Um, I see jobs to be done as a lens, as a lens that we can use in lots of different practical ways. And I just wanted to show a couple of practical ways that you can uh, think about using jobs to be done. So I encourage you all, first of all, to go out and read more about jobs to be done. That's kind of my, my call to action, is I want to make this, this topic, this concept, known to this community. But I want to give some specific examples of how you can apply it. In discovering value, in finding uh, new opportunities, understanding your market, in designing solutions for that market, in packaging and delivering and creating language around your solutions, but then also in innovating and redefining your position in the market. You can use uh, the jobs to be done thinking as a way of seeing um, to help you do any or all of these. So in terms of discovering value, right, we like to do a lot of qualitative research, ob observations, ethnography, contextual inquiry. Um, and you know, it's always a challenge. If you've ever done qualitative research, it's a challenge to make sense of all of that data and, and present it back in a way that makes sense. Here's one way that you can do it. Um, this was a project that I was working on um, a while back when I was looking at um, small law lawyers in Germany and how they do new business development. How does a law office in Germany do new business development? And I went out and talked to a dozen lawyers and I listened to them and I was listening for jobs to be done. And what I did is I created a hierarchical description of 
the things that I heard. So down here, these are individual statements or tasks that I grouped into uh, a cluster that I then grouped up here into a higher level um, kind of pattern that for me um, pointed to a value, a, a, a higher level drive, driver for, for the lawyer. I'm gonna zoom in on this just so you can see some of the language there. So lawyers were telling me they, they wrote uh, articles. Why would a lawyer write an article? Well, because they, they need to publish to stay relevant. Well, why would they do that? Because that improves their reputation. And reputation feeds into new business and becoming a, a successful law firm. So it's almost like the five whys. Do you, you guys know the five whys? It's about asking the question, well, why do you do that? Why do you do that? And asking the question why will always expand and get more towards the underlying motivation. Within the jobs to be done framework, if we're looking at this as a process or a progress towards a goal, <clears throat> We can, we can use this, this line of thinking, um, both questioning uh, the audience, uh, the consumers, but also as a way to describe it back to our internal stakeholders. I can make sense of the jobs to be done and, and use these models to, um, to uh, capture and create the, um, a, a diagram, an artifact that we can then talk about internally inside of, inside of my team. And this, this, this method represents uh, or resembles uh, mental model diagrams. Does anybody know mental model diagrams? Indy Young's book that came out in 2008. Yeah, you create these really long um, diagrams that are essentially a hierarchical representation of jobs to be done. She doesn't call them jobs to be done, um, but it's a very similar uh, perspective. So we're kind of doing this already. That's what I said. This should, if this feels natural and comfortable to you, I hope, I hope that's a good thing. Here's me at a go-to meeting, and we did some research where we created a hierarchical model of jobs to be done that people were doing. But look what we called this thing. We didn't say buy, go to meeting, or get better HD video for your webcams. How do people work? Um, it was really how do people work together, because we were looking at collaboration. But how do people work together? That's what we wanted to understand. And we presented this back to the folks that go to meeting. Um, and guess what? High definition video doesn't solve any of these jobs that people have. It's not, that's not, what they're, they're, that's not gonna help them try to get you know, what they're trying to get done better. And we had gaps, so the thing, we were missing out on opportunities, but focused on the wrong opportunities because we were focused on the technology for technology's sake. 10% more increase in video quality, so what? And that, by the way, that the HD video webcams brought almost no revenue back to the company. I mean, it didn't really help uh, go to meeting in the way that they hoped that it would. The second thing that you can do is when you're designing, uh, when you're designing a solution, so that's understanding the market, but I can also design for the market as well, too. And there's this notion of job stories. A guy named Alan Clement um, talking about um, how user stories are so poorly formulated. As a user, I want to log in. Nobody wants to log in. That's not what they want to do. They want to access their content, right? The login, that, you're, you're putting a barrier there. That's friction. <laughs> I don't, want, I don't want to log in. So he, he suggests that we reformulate the way that we're writing user stories to say, when I'm in this situation, I want to, um, you know, when I'm, when I'm on the go, I want to access my content so that I can continue working on a document at work or something like that. Now, job stories are probably aren't gonna replace your user stories. Anybody work with user stories and Agile and stuff like that? Okay, okay, so you kinda know what user stories are. These probably aren't gonna replace your user stories in your backlog, but what you can do, and this is what my colleagues at, at Mural do, is before they go and design something, so they're designing a new feature set or a new capability, they list all of the job stories up front, and this is a Mural, so we have these big uh, canvases. And in the upper left of the canvas, they say, okay, what are the jobs that people are trying to get done in the context of this solution? And they write them out as job stories. Um, the engineers might then use user stories to measure burn down rate after that, but these, these become then guiding principles to look at, not what's our technology or what technology are they using, but just what are people trying to get done? What are the jobs that people are trying to get done? And it helps frame the conversation and keep that as reference. Right? So when you're designing that login screen, it doesn't say people want to log in says they want to access their content, right? The third thing that you can do is help, job, jobs to be done can help you deliver value. Um, and in this case, and I did this too when I was working at uh, Citrix, where we looked at a marketing language, right? So just looking at how you're phrasing things back to the market. Uh, our con this might be a, you know, a slogan or a statement that you see on a brochure. Our conferencing software features high definition video with the best resolution. That's technology, technology, technology. But what are you trying to get done with that technology? Well, you can connect with your remote colleagues on a more personal level with true-to-life video. 
That's that same thought rewritten from a jobs to be done perspective. So we went through that exercise of actually looking at language, speaking to the market from its own perspective. What are you trying to get done? And actually, when you do this, you see, well, people actually, that's, you don't actually need that. That doesn't help you get your job to be done. Um, or, or at Mural, um, I'm in charge of the uh, customer support team, and we have a help desk where we have articles that describe our functionality. And we use that framework that I just showed to actually structure the content of our help articles. So each one of our articles begins with a verb that um, represents the uh, functional job. So you can paste from a spreadsheet. So that's the functional job. The very first sentence, though, on all of our help articles is really the desired outcome. Well, why do you want to do that? It's to increase your ease of working with content across documents. Right? There's no feature, there's no technology mentioned there. You might say document is a technology, but I didn't want to say source because that's a little too abstract. But you know, working with content across documents, that's what you're trying to get done. The spreadsheet is a feature. It's a function that helps you do that. And then we talk about the situation, why, when and why would you do that. We describe in steps the continuation of the functional job. And then we end with a little bit of emotion there, feeling control of your content. Impress your colleagues, the social job as well, too. So this becomes a checklist for us to, to write help content article. It's not dogmatic. You can, you, can, you, know, you can go off of this beaten path if it doesn't make sense to do it. But we believe that we're speaking, when somebody comes up to this article, that this is their frame of mind, that they're trying to get something done, and we're trying to speak to them in that way. We know you're trying to get something done, and we're going to talk to you as if you are trying to get something done. And then finally, um, jobs to be done can help us redefine our value and reframe our market and our position, and even what it means to be a competitor. Right? We have this notion of, of markets that are actually artificial boxes that we put ourselves into. We're in the, you know, the tax software market, and we compare ourselves to other tax softwares. Right? But that's not what your customer's doing. Your customer's just trying to get a job done. So Scott Cook founded a company called Intuit in the United States, which is the largest tax software producer. They help you fill your taxes out once a year. Um, and he, uh, he's quoted as saying this, um, the greatest competitor in tax software it was not the industry or other tax software offerings. It was the pencil. The pencil is a tough and resilient substitute, sorry, yet the entire industry had overlooked it. Right? So think about it from your perspective, somebody trying to fill out taxes. Right? You got a lot of papers, you got a lot of numbers, screens, screen one, screen two, I got to carry a number over from screen one to screen two, or do a side calculation. What are you going to do, what are you going to grab as a solution, what are you going to go for to, to get that job done? A pencil. Right? So he's, he's looking at the job to be done and looking at his market not just developing a solution, but looking at his market through the eyes of the customer, saying, we're tax software, we compete with a pencil. Right? There's a very good book by Alan Clement, and the title of the book is When Coffee and Kale Compete. Because right? what's, the, what's the job of coffee in the morning? It's to give you energy. Right? But kale juice might give you energy as well, too. So in that context, in, defined in that situation, the job to be done is get energy so coffee and kale compete. Tax software and pencils compete. Um, but this line of thinking then lets you actually expand your market, not by finding more customers doing the same thing or, or, or buying competitors, but by expanding by, by adding new jobs to what you cover and um, looking at how pencils and tax software can compete. So jobs to be done, it offers a practical lens. I think it's a lens. It's a way of seeing. right? <clears throat> And it's a way of seeing that's similar to things that are out there already, but it comes from the business community. And I think we should be more involved um, in these conversations in our organizations. And it allows you to view, to view various aspects of your organization. It, it can pervade the organization. It doesn't just have to be high-level strategy like it's positioned in a lot of the business books. You can use jobs to be done thinking to help you organize your own research, to design solutions, to even write text and copy and things like that. But the overall effect, I think, is it helps us shift the view from the outside in, looking at our industry and our, and our company from the outside, um, uh, from the inside out, rather, and be able to look at it from the outside in, to see the market as customers and, and, and human beings see themselves. So quickly to summarize, uh, you know, at the core of disruption, and I think this is really cool, at the core of disruption, this, this uh, very important business theory is this notion of jobs to be done, which is a very human, uh, very human focused um, uh, notion. And I think it's relevant to designers and that we can apply it in practical ways. 
One quick quote before I end, and this is kind of where the jobs to be done thinking comes from. Theodore Levitt, famous business professor, used to tell his students um, that people don't want to buy a quarter inch drill, they want a quarter inch hole. Right? So as manufacturers, we're focused on our technology. We sell drills, buy our drill. I'll tell you about the specifications of my drill. Right? The customer just wants a hole in their wall. And there might be other ways to do that. But if we think about it from, from the customer's perspective, it, 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 flips our, it flips our view of how we create value. Discovering value, designing value, delivering value, and redefining value. So thank you very much. <laughs>